we think is basically um, uh, plants since have uh, colonized the world uh, far before humans uh, and due to their social uh, um, uh, nature had to develop uh, um, uh, many and efficient strategies for adapting to uh, a continuously changing environment and to um, across uh, a different uh, type of uh, climates. So they look to us a perfect model of adaptation. Uh, when uh, we are thinking to robots uh, that needs to live uh, and act uh, in real environments. And, uh, um, but we are not used to think uh, of plants as models, val valuable model for robotics. Uh, we are more used to look at animals, to think that animals could be the perfect model. Uh, but uh, um, we can look, let's say, to both because they have uh, different characteristics and they can bring uh, different ideas, uh, for example, for locomotion. Um, uh, while uh, animals are based uh, on muscle-based movements, plants act, uh, sense and act uh, with uh, different uh, approaches, but they do have uh, very interesting features. Uh, we couldn't perceive, for instance, their movement, but since uh, um, the, the time-lapse uh, technologies uh, have evolved, uh, we can also now appreciate the very fast, but also as well, uh, very slow movements, uh, like uh, the, the slow motion induced by the growth of plants. And in fact, uh, uh, by looking at, um, at them, we can observe a variety of different type of movements and uh, actuation mechanism that allow them to act in different way and to um, comply and to, their, to adapt their bodies to perform a different task like uh, grasping uh, different shapes of object and um, um, and, and move across uh, different uh, um, voids and a variety of uh, environments. And as well, they are also able to communicate. They can exchange uh, somehow information through chemical signals or uh, thanks to the use of uh, uh, the below ground uh, uh, nectar of fungi and other uh, organisms that can uh, um, conduct the, can. Uh, be a mean of uh, transportation for messages. Indeed, uh, we can look at plant uh, for developing new technologies and vice versa, we can uh, develop uh, biomimicking uh, robots, uh, robophysical models to use uh, to validate hypotheses that will be otherwise difficult to validate uh, through the direct experiments uh, on the biological system. So today we are going to look uh, just to a subsystem, a subset uh, of uh, possible attraction mechanism of plants. For example, the grow, which is uh, the um, fundamental actuation for plants uh, to, to move, uh, to navigate uh, their uh, surrounding. Um, in fact, uh, thanks to the addition of new cells at uh, their extremities, uh, they can uh, extend across uh, um, uh, um, uh, kilometers in the below ground, they can perceive a multitude of different signals from the environment and direct accordingly their uh, grow to in order for them to survive. Uh, we start in fact by looking at plant roots uh, to try to imitate this perception and uh, actuation uh, strategies. And uh, we first uh, try to analyze uh, how and where uh, this uh, grow uh, happened, uh, which uh, were the functionalities of the different part of the different region of uh, the, the roots. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, one of uh, the, the features of uh, this uh, system is, uh, for example, the release of uh, dead cells and mucus at their extremities. And uh, this uh, release of uh, um, cells help uh, the roots to better penetrate uh, into the soil. So inspired by this uh, mechanism, we developed uh, a, a system that was able to avert uh, a skin at its uh, extremity. And, uh, as uh, for the, the real plant, uh, we 
embedded some artificial hairs in order for uh, this robotic system to better anchor its skin uh, into the soil. Um, this way, the system could uh, penetrate vertically into the soil, opening up uh, the, the below ground. But uh, cell uh, division is another story, let's say. So cell division means uh, addition of new material, new uh, material that is added, uh, uh, like in this uh, schematic at the very extremity. And to imitate this concept of addition of new material, we first prototype a system with a simple string that is wrapped around in a circular manner next to the tip. And it was indeed creating a sort of body by the addition of a layer by layer but uh, we cannot only penetrate vertically into the soil. Of course, if we want, uh, we need uh, probably to change direction in the presence of obstacle, or if we want to look uh, to follow uh, an environmental stimuli for look and looking for its uh, source, uh, we need uh, to uh, integrate a sort of uh, bending, a turning of the system. To be able to do this, uh, we upgrade uh, the technology uh, by um, using a thermoplastic material and uh, uh, implementing uh, in this uh, plotting mechanism um, uh, all the, the basic principle of uh, fuse deposition modeling technique, like uh, um, a 3D printer that is able indeed to um, uh, thermally uh, melt the, 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 the material in order for it to adhere to the previous layer. In this way, we can build um, a structure, a real structure, uh, a tubular structure, and we can direct uh, its, uh, um, we can control, direct control uh, the plotting in order to have a different uh, um, uh, material deposition at the opposite sides uh, of, uh, of the system. And in this way, we can indeed achieve uh, the a bending of, um, of, in this case, of the robotic route. Uh, what uh, can we do with this uh, implementation? We can imitate uh, um, uh, some behaviors of, of plants, uh, for, for instance, uh, the tropic responses. Uh, what are the tropism? Are uh, directed grow uh, of uh, the, the organ that uh, um, are commanded by the local perception. So the, as uh, Charles Darwin used to think, we um, uh, embedded in directly in the robotic uh, apex uh, the, the control of this uh, grow um, and, and the sensing related to the, uh, to the behavior. So we know in fact that uh, um, uh, roots are able to perceive a multitude of uh, physical chemical uh, uh, signals from the environment and they need to find what could be the uh, preferential direction of growth for them to survive. And uh, indeed they need to merge all the possible uh, uh, signals through these uh, uh, behaviors that are called in fact uh, uh, the tropism. In this example, we see the Zeamice roots that respond to gravity, so directing uh, uh, their tips uh, uh, towards uh, the gravity, or they avoid uh, the obstacle, they keep growing when encountering a barrier, or they follow a gradient of nutrients into uh, the soil. And similarly, we embedded uh, into a robotic root uh, um, uh, a control where uh, each tropism can be um, seen as a single behavior. So there is a sense and a response and actuation to that specific sense. So to gravity, temperature, humidity, touch, and so on. And what we can uh, um, obtain is a final behavior that sum all together this uh, uh, single behavior um, to obtain the final direction uh, um, to follow. But um, uh, also we have to consider that uh, um, probably all these uh, tropism need to dynamically change. So the attraction towards this stimuli um, are probably uh, 
uh, adjusted according to an internal state of the plant. And uh, um, uh, is an easy example to show, to, to be clear, is the foraging uh, uh, mechanism in plants. Uh, so they need uh, um, uh, for a perfect, for, a, um, uh, for keeping uh, all the internal processes um, uh, in, in balance to have also an, in, an internal quantity of uh, uh, nutrients that are balanced uh, among themselves. And uh, to do this, uh, since uh, uh, the environment uh, um, is uncertain, so there isn't uh, the certainty to obtain always uh, the uh, enough amount of nutrients, uh, what the plants do is to adjust uh, its uptake according on what is found in the environment and on its uh, um, uh, history. So uh, the knowledge that it has uh, about uh, internal knowledge uh, state of the, of the nutrients. If we adjust uh, um, in this way, we considered a sort of uh, memory uh, to adjust uh, the uptake kinetic parameters that are uh, used to um, uh, dynamically change the weight for each of the nutrient. And uh, um, so this weight uh, coupled with uh, the local perception in the environment of uh, the, the nutrients in the soil and uh, uh, the uptake that is taken for each nutrient uh, is merged with uh, all the other tropism in order to obtain the final direction uh, of growth. Uh, by implementing this uh, uh, control in, uh, in our system, uh, we interestingly uh, observe uh, um, an altruistic behavior, let's say. So the, the roots were sharing uh, the, the nutrients found in the environment, um, uh, but uh, uh, starting from uh, their local knowledge of the surrounding and taking independently a decision about uh, their individual growth, uh, if uh, we look at, like a big brother at the um, internal state of the nutrients, what we found is that uh, um, the nutrients try to reach uh, the optimal ratio and to keep uh, uh, the, the balance uh, um, among them uh, differently from uh, a system, a control where we were using uh, a non-dynamic uh, uh, weight of, uh, of, the, uh, of the nutrients. Um, another thing, so if uh, we want to, to change, let's say the, the abstraction level, uh, of, uh, of the plant that we are looking at uh, is passing from the organ abstraction to the tissue uh, level, we can think of uh, um, many cells interconnected by biochemical signals uh, and uh, uh, that um, uh, signals that have each uh, um, a weight uh, di uh, differently distributed uh, uh, along the tissue and have uh, um, a signal propagation. And uh, this uh, uh, mechanism can uh, be described by artificial uh, neural network. Um, uh, and through the, uh, the computational model, we try to investigate on the possible conditions for the circuit mutations to emerge in the, the plant roots. Uh, circuit mutations are very peculiar movement that are oscillatory movement uh, adopted by the, uh, the roots, but uh, are also Mm, um, pretty much unknown um, in biology. And uh, what we found by uh, performing different combination of weight uh, and uh, signal propagation, for example, is that uh, we could observe the emergence of uh, um, uh, circuit notations uh, given a certain combination of uh, gravity signal uh, propagation and, and sensitivity as well as uh, from the interaction between the gravitropism and the tigmotropism. But also we investigated the role of this uh, um, uh, motion for resources exploration. And in this case, uh, um, it is needed an internal uh, oscillator that uh, uh, whose parameters are regulated by the uh, chemicals, uh, the resources perceived uh, in the environment. Very briefly, other type of uh, movement uh, um, uh, are uh, actuated instead by 
another basic principle, which is uh, the osmosis. Uh, for example, uh, it is used uh, in uh, the closing uh, um, of uh, the venous fly trap of the closing uh, of the leaf and the venous fly trap to capture the prey. And so indeed we have uh, a flow of water that passes from uh, um, uh, low ionic concentration chamber to a higher uh, ionic concentration chamber to change the turgor uh, of the cell. And uh, by imitating this uh, mm, uh, assessment of uh, uh, ionic concentration among two chambers, what we obtain is in fact an osmotic uh, actuator able, uh, for example, to, um, uh, with a, a preloaded mechanism to um, uh, actuate fast motion uh, with a, a cantilever, for example, or to lift uh, um, a, a beam of uh, a couple of uh, kilo. Uh, this uh, previous uh, uh, actuation, uh, in, um, however, was uh, only forward, uh, so was not reversible, but by adopting uh, um, electrodes for um, controlling uh, the, um, uh, the ionic concentration in one of the chambers, we could achieve also a reversible motion that is uh, instead much more <laughs> useful uh, in robotics. We need, uh, um, however, to consider that uh, these uh, um, actuation based on pure uh, uh, diffusion are pretty slow. And in fact, if we look again at nature, we see that uh, uh, nature merge these uh, uh, um, uh, principles with actually structure that introduce some sort of instability. By imitating the, the, the uh, arrangement of um, uh, the fibers, for example, from the venous fly trap and uh, um, in a material uh, that has been functionalized with uh, um, uh, oriented uh, hygromorphic fiber, we uh, could achieve uh, um, similar performance uh, um, in terms of uh, um, actuation uh, time scale and uh, a better performance uh, using uh, this uh, be stable uh, structure with respect to a simple diffusion mechanism. Where we want to go is uh, towards a new generation of plant-inspired growing uh, artifacts that can better imitate uh, plants' functionalities uh, uh, in terms of the body adaptation um, uh, and morphological computation. So demanding part of uh, the computation to the uh, material properties and to the compliancy uh, of uh, the, their structures, possibly also um, uh, taking advantage of uh, green energy and that can exploit a novel uh, system for um, communication, so novel uh, um, solutions for communication. So putting together um, multiple agents that can uh, indeed be adopted, uh, hopefully for um, a more sustainable management of the ecosystems. To do all, to reach all these ambitious uh, uh, goals, uh, of course, uh, we need a lot of uh, investigations and uh, um, realization of uh, new soft uh, sensors and actuators uh, and um, more functional uh, materials. Uh, and uh, we need the definition of uh, a new design rules uh, that better can uh, um, the, be followed for the, the designing these plant-inspired robots. Uh, and we need um, a set of uh, new uh, manufacturing technologies for this. But uh, all of this effort um, uh, should be, I mean, it is worth to, to, to be spent uh, because we have seen that plants can offer a variety of different uh, new abilities that can be embedded in, the, in our robots. All these works uh, cannot be done if not uh, in a multidisciplinary team and uh, with a tight uh, uh, collaborations uh, across different uh, uh, disciplines and uh, people. So thanks to all the people that work on these and other projects within the, the lab. Thanks for the funding and thank you all for your kind attention.
Thank you very much, Emanuela, for your talk and the overview. So we have uh, time left to discuss and for questions. Ah, there are some questions from the audience. Please, again, if you want to, uh, to ask a question, just unmute yourself, and maybe turn on your camera if you wish and, and ask your question. Hi, this is Ian Walker. Um, so I, I, I enjoyed the talk very much. I wonder if you could uh, perhaps say a few more about a few more things about the structural reprogrammability of, of plants with respect to say animals. I mean, you mentioned it in, in the initial slides and also in the conclusions, uh, but to me, it's a very important part of the, the entire motivation for what we're doing. And I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Well, for reprogrammability, we have to consider that we need, uh, as I mentioned, the new manufacturing technologies that perhaps can be embedded directly in the robotic system. So as we did, for example, with uh, the growing robot, uh, is exactly to, to bring uh, this uh, uh, concept of additive manufacturing and to embed, embed it directly into the robot. So if we are able to embed these and combine these uh, uh, new approaches of manufacturing with uh, perhaps uh, functional materials that can uh, introduce uh, um, uh, um, a shape morphing of uh, uh, the structure could be um, in fact uh, not only an imitation of what plants uh, can, uh, can do, but uh, uh, an extremely new frontiers for, uh, for robotics. And that is uh, more or less uh, the goal uh, in the long distance. <laughs> okay, thanks. You're welcome. I also have the question. You made a list of, of uh, yeah, things that the tools that are wanted, let's say most wanted in the next uh, years. For example, you said functional materials, we need we need uh, other computational technologies. And uh, so what of this, this uh, long list uh, uh, would be the most desired for you to have? Um, at the moment, I think um, we need not only uh, functional materials, but uh, we need also to better understand the biological model. I mean, uh, uh, we need the technologies uh, for deeply investigating on the functionalities of this uh, uh, model, which is quite new for robotics. Um, uh, until we don't get uh, how it works, so we cannot really think how to translate uh, uh, their functions into an artificial system. So um, we are, have approached uh, the, the problem by looking at different level of abstractions, but uh, um, uh, we, for the moment, probably uh, keep our observation to um, uh, quite a high level. Uh, so let's say to the organ level, um, probably we need to, go in parallel towards also um, to going into a deeper level. So I think also uh, molecular biology could uh, help uh, as well as bioinformatics. We need uh, a lot of different disciplines that are still nowadays uh, far away from this uh, uh, world. And we need to bring, uh, bring uh, them in. So are there any other questions? We have a, uh, still a bit of time left, about 10 minutes to the next talk. So I will uh, use the chance again to remind you of the Discord server, which I just posted the link. Emanuela, uh, 
Nice yeah. presentation. Yes. Could hi. You give, hi. I, I didn't get uh, right the uh, mechanism of this uh, Venus flytrap um, system, of this bistable system. Okay, so in that uh, study, uh, we looked uh, at the um, uh, um, arrangement of the tissues uh, uh, in, the, in the Venus. Probably I can go back in the presentation and show you more slowly <laughs> the, um, okay, the images. Okay. So we investigated first Okay, so we looked, uh, we sampled some of these closing leaves. Uh, we were looking at the tissue distribution, at the cell distribution uh, over this uh, um, cross section uh, in horizontal and vertical way. And uh, so it's kind of, they are embedding uh, an oriented, uh, an orientation of uh, um, an oriented structures that allow them to to snap from one open position to the closed position. And to imitate that, okay, we prepare this uh, PDMS fun where we pre-stretched the, the, um, the sheets and where we deposited the oriented fibers that were responding in this case, uh, uh, humidity. So when uh, the, the two layers of PDMS with differently oriented fibers are coupled, they um, embed somehow these two different directions of uh, um, that can give uh, the, the, this uh, opening and closing of the leaf. So uh, since the, the fiber that were deposited on, uh, on this material uh, were agromorphic, in uh, response to the humidity present in the environment, uh, they can uh, make, uh, induce a bending of the system and uh, um, uh, make it uh, snap from uh, one curvature to, to the other. So this uh, uh, B-stable system was compared actually with uh, a pure diffuse uh, um, uh, System. So in this case, uh, as shown here, we in parallel prepare um, another um, layer of PDMS that were not uh, stretched with a single orientation of the fiber. Okay. In this case, uh, the pure diffusion is acting on, on, the, on the system and we see that uh, the snapping can be obtained uh, much faster. So the banding uh, can be obtained much faster uh, cap, uh, using this uh, stable uh, mechanism. Okay, so this is then on the one hand um, actuated by the hydrophilicity and on yes. the other hand, uh, also the snapback is just by the geometry or is it yes. also be, be okay. Thank you. The next speaker is Ian Walker. Uh, he's professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Clemson University in the US, and he will talk about plant inspired continuum robots. So you can share your screen and. Okay, Let's see. So let's see, hopefully we can see, hopefully, there we go. Um, hopefully people can see the screen. Um, hearing no, yes, seeing a nod, that's good. So yes, so thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with you um, today. And so I want to talk a little bit about continuum robots in particular and uh, their relationship to tendrils and uh, searches uh, in particular. So 
Uh, I'm going to start by talking about robots and, and move towards plants, sort of the, the opposite of the, the way Emanuela did it, but hopefully will be consistent. Um, so in particular, I want to talk about uh, tendril-like continuum robots. So I have to define what continuum robots are, um, but and then I'm going to talk about long, thin variants of those things. And uh, so historically, the way our group, uh, Clemson in the States, have approached this is that we started building from the robotics perspective. And so we started building structures and realized that there were many things, there still remain many things that we don't understand about how to make them work. And so then we started to look for inspiration and we sort of discovered the world of plants. Uh, and so we're applying that um, in ways that we'll see as we, we go through the talk. So, um, if you're not familiar with the idea of continuum robots, then they are distinct from traditional robots, rigid link robots, uh, intuitively at least in, in, as the world between the vertebrate and the invertebrate. The typical robots uh, have rigid links and they're connected by joints and so they look a little bit like human arms, fingers, legs and so on. Um, and they inherit some of the advantages in terms of, of strength and precision of those structures. And continuum robots are, are different in the sense that they're continuous backbone. So they're things that are more like snakes and, and uh, octopus arms and plant stems in many ways. And so they lack the, the elbows and the wrists and the, the vertebrae of those things. And that gives them both their advantages and disadvantages. So continuum robots, if you think of a snake or you think about uh, something like an elephant's trunk, then you can put that into a place that it's very hard to put uh, something like a human leg. You don't have arms and rigid links, rigid constraints to get in the way. So you can wrap around objects of, of various sizes. You can enter into confined spaces in ways that conventional robots just simply can't. And you have, in theory, an infinite number of degrees of freedom. If you think of a string and you constrain a string a little bit, you, you still have many degrees of freedom. Although when you build those robots, then you, then you impose constraints on the world. Um, but um, the, the key point about these robots is that they are inherently compliant. Um, so very unlike the vertebrate world of robotics, if you go and you touch or you push against a, a conventional robot system, unless there is special software um, that is, is being run to try to make those robots compliant, you have mechanical compliance in the system, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, it's, it helps you in your interface with the environment, but you have to do something to make that work. Um, so they're soft robots in that sense. Um, and the, also the other thing about them is that they are uh, continuous bodied. And so there are some examples here on the slide. Uh, an example top left is, is one of the tendril robots that we built at, at Clemson. And then there, there are other robots you typically today we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about having uh, continuum backbones, a single continuous backbone with elements in series. But you can put them in parallel as we can see in the bottom left, which was some early work from Japan um, led by Susamori's group. Um, using them for grasping. And uh, generally speaking, continuum robots, people have been looking at those things for, well, depending how you count them for 50 years, but probably very actively for the last 20 years or so. And uh, the, the, the most effective home, the, the place where there are practical applications or the, the most practical applications are in medicine. And so uh, at the bottom right, there's Hanson uh, Medical's Magellan system. And so the, the large, system that you see um, is something of the order of um, a meter in length. Um, but the business end of it, I'm not quite sure if you can see my pointer, is this bit down here. And so this is actually a, essentially a cable that goes into the human body to perform various operations, um, to place stents, to um, take samples, to provide visual um, information back. So something like a, uh, an endoscope, an active robotic endoscope. Um, and so in that world, um, there are a number of commercial systems uh, that are doing very good things with respect to minimally invasive surgery, um, endoscopy, and so on. Um, and typically what happens in those cases is those are relatively thin devices and they're entering into the environment and they're going into tubes in the body. So they're bronchoscopes or they're endoscopes or they're um, going into arteries. And so essentially what they're doing is they're sliding within tubular structures, generally speaking, within the human body. And they're very good at that. That's a, a, a very good application and a very good match between technology and application. 
Um, and what I'd like to talk about today mostly is about what happens when you go from that sort of environment into a wider world. So uh, talking about a tendril robot, give a sense of the sorts of things we're looking at. This, this is my PhD student, Michael Wooden, and um, what he's about to show. This is the, uh, the tendril robot that we built. So um, this is something, there's an actuation package above his head um, with electric motors. And so these are carbon fiber tubes nested together. So it's what's called a concentric tube structure. And we're um, actuating those remotely via uh, tendons. And it's a spring loaded system. I'll play it one more time to get a sense of, of the, the compliance uh, in that system. And this is something that we developed under funding from NASA. And NASA's uh, goal for us was to develop something of the order of three meters long uh, with a maximum diameter of about half a centimeter. Uh, and so basically a, a, an active cable of some sort. And what do what did we build so basically we have spring-loaded concentric tubes so i'll play a, a video on the left to give a sense of this particular uh, example is about a two meter length uh, device and so here we can see uh, we'll see it it bending so by pulling on the cables we can bend it we can also by pulling on cables together we can contract it so there we saw some, some contraction now we see some expansion so we can grow and we can ungrow um, this system in that sense. So we're pulling against springs to be able to do that. And this shows that we have looked at some kinematic modeling. And so the, the right is the simulation and on the left is the actual um, device, a little bit of friction there, slowing down the initial um, movement of those things. And so what does that look like when we take it off the table? So I'll stop that video for the moment. And uh, so here is an example. Again, I hope you can see my pointer. So the actual tendril robot is, or the, the tip of it is this orange piece here. Um, the color of my university is orange. Uh, and the way we're actuating this, this is at NASA Johnson Space Center actually doing a demonstration for the sponsor. So we're teleoperating this with a kinematically similar device. So there is a device here, which my student again is going to, to bend and uh, he can bend and extend the device that, that he is moving and the uh, the tendril robot itself follows those motions. And so what you'll see in a minute, there is a tip camera on the end of the robot, which is about here. There is a whiteboard here and there is writing on the back of the whiteboard. And what we'll see on this screen here is the result of that, of what we see. And so you can see that uh, uh, Michael here is, is bending the robot. And I hope that you, you can see that when he's bending um, the, the last section, he's bending the tip. And as he bends the tip, then the, the tip, which is behind the screen there, is able to bend and we can see the backside of the, uh, of the uh, whiteboard there. And then as he bends it a little bit more, then he's able to bend the tip, which is here in the system, to see himself and he's able to wave at himself. So um, this is an example of, of direct teleoperation of, of these sorts of systems, which is what uh, the funding agency NASA wanted to do. Why do they want to do such things? Well, they're interested in inspection operations on the International Space Station. So, um, as you may know, the, on the space station in the modules, they have large equipment racks. And so they're, you know, the order of um, larger than a human height, typical human height tall. And they look like this device down here on the left. And so they have all sorts of equipment packed inside it. And so there are layers of equipment where there are, there's equipment behind equipment. Um, the ISS is very densely packed with things. And then these equipment racks are essentially, they form the walls and the ceiling and the floor around the astronauts. Things are a little different in, in zero G. And so uh, one of the things that uh, NASA need to do periodically is they need to ins inspect equipment within these racks. And so the traditional mode of that is that the astronauts have to pull one of these racks out of the wall of the space station, and then they have to inspect it and pull out all the equipment and so on. And it's actually a very time consuming job that requires a lot of astronaut time and effort. And so what NASA are interested in doing is having something that can inspect these things automatically. And so basically what we uh, were asked to do was to develop essentially this long thin cable that could be inserted inside the equipment racks and also between them uh, to inspect things. And the idea is to go between them. You want to look at the back wall of the, uh, of, of the structure because one, another concern in the space station is impact from micrometeorite damage. 
um, which could, you know, if you have a uh, significant impact, then it would impact the entire safety of the system. So here in the top right is a picture. This is the, the gap between two racks. So this is of the order of a centimeter, um, the gap. And so that's one of these walls and then another wall on this side, another rack. And so our task was to go along inside between the racks and then turn and inspect the wall behind the racks. And so as an example, with the tip camera, you can get a sense of that. So here we are, here are the, the, the bottom and top or the left and right here are the, are the two racks. Then there's a, a bracing element there. And now we're going behind the racks and looking briefly back at the where we came from. And this is the back wall. So here we're looking at the back wall of the, the full 3D scale uh, mock-up. And uh, we were looking back here and we were able to find an abnormality on the wall. And so to do this, we had to go back a long way and then we had to make a 90 degree turn and then still have the ability to maneuver to be able to, to see things. And here's another example going inside the one of the equipment racks and then looking at some of the, the cabling uh, inside. So these are the sorts of, of applications that um, thin continuum robots or tendril robots as we began to call them are very good at doing. But then um, the two examples I've talked about so far, so this does not really connect yet to, to plants. Um, the medical applications and this application both benefit from essentially the, the, the lack of opposition of in particular gravity. So when you're moving these things inside the human body, then you have the human body itself, the tubular supports, if you're, if you're going inside uh, arteries and so on, and going to the heart, you have support for the structure. And so the fact that the structure is not inherently strong is not a problem. And in the International Space Station inspection application, then you have a zero G environment. And so you're able to where you put the, the, the stem, if you like, of the robot, it stays, at least in, in the zero G application. But when you want to come and use these things in, for example, um, inspection on, on our planet, then thin structures are affected very strongly by gravity and other external forces. And so there are structural issues to, to be considered. And so in the, the robots that we've looked at, there's a lot of coupling through the backbone. So as you make a movement in one part of the system, then it reflects in other parts of the system. It's underactuated. There are, again, in theory, an infinite number of degrees of freedom. And you can only apply a finite number of actuators. In this particular case, we're applying nine actuators to shape that, that robot. And then um, you, the shape is determined not only by what you do with the actuators, but also by the external forces and the internal stiffnesses. So it, it's hard to predict exactly what is going to happen. And the question is, how do you make the most out of those thin structures, particularly for in earth uh, inspection operations, which is one of our major um, application areas. So um, we looked around and we started thinking and we, we explored the world of plants and we started thinking about how plants do this. And one thing that we discovered um, was that plants, at least thin stemmed plants, vines in particular, they exploit their environment very much to, to help them with such things. So we have um, thin plants, as we can see some feelers here, um, reach, they reach out and they grow and they actively engage the environment. So again, uh, what we're talking about here is, is uh, moving through open space. So different again from the, the root situation uh, where there are a different set of problems that, that, uh, uh, that were talked about by Emanuela in the, in the first talk. Uh, but the plants will reach for and engage the environment and then find structurally sound uh, elements in the environment and engage those things. As Emanuela was mentioning, um, they have ways to grasp uh, and then basically they can use the environment to, to, to support their movement. And in fact, that's what allows plants to, to be able to, um, vines in particular, to be able to devote much of their energy to growth rather than structural support because they use the environment for structural support. And how is it done? Well, it's done in a lot of very interesting ways um, that most of which are completely unexplored in, in the world of continuum robotics or robotics in general. Um, Plants generate hooks and thorns and pads and roots and tendrils. So um, things are done by adhesive, things are done mechanically, um, things are done by growing tendrils and stiffening them. 
Um, there are lots of different ways that different plants and different ways that sometimes the same plant will use to be able to adhere to the environment so that they can then stabilize themselves. What good does that do them? One thing that that does is that then if you can reach with a distal part of your structure and you stabilize against the environment, then that stabilizes all of the proximal part, all of the part back to the, the roots. Um, and so therefore you are less, uh, you're more stable and less vulnerable to external forces. And you, you're much more predictable in the behavior that you can generate. So we looked at these things a few years ago and we thought about, well, what, what could we do that could be similar, could be useful, could, what could we extract from this? And our first approach was to just simply look at things like rose bushes and roses have prickles, uh, as we see in the left hand figure, and they're very effective at growing uh, and again, ad adapting to their environment uh, using these prickles. Those prickles are, as anyone who's grown roses knows, are very sharp, but also very effective in, in contacting the environment. So we basically made prickles by just bending pins, very simple, the simplest possible mechanical structure. So they're completely unintelligent at this point, but they can be effective. So here's an example of, of uh, our robot doing a, a very simple growth pattern. So it's the same, essentially the same robot design we've seen before. So spring loaded concentric tubes. And so we're, we're growing up a, a structure. So this fence is, is a simply a, a, a wire mesh and those, uh, it, I believe it's a centimeter square. And so basically what we're doing is we're extending, we're actually releasing the tendons against the springs to enable growth. And as we grow, then what we're doing is we're hooking into the structure. So that's the close up we're seeing here um, at the proximal and the, the distal ends. And uh, uh, again, growth can be achieved in lots of ways. I, I think that one of the open questions perhaps for the discussion at the end is how might we achieve growth? What does growth really mean for robotics as opposed to plants? So in this case, we're, we're doing a very simple thing. We're just allowing a structure to Sorry, Ian, I just muted you. Sorry for that. Okay, no problem. Um, so yes, so we, we're just, uh, it's, it's a very simple uh, system, but it allows us to, to, to extend our reach into environments um, to get much further uh, into places that we want to go. And so um, this was our first attempt at looking at, um, hello, prickles. Oh, here we go. Um, so, since then, we've been looking at, at searcher tendrils. So the idea of uh, the, the picture in the, the top right, um, many plants have, have tendrils that they grow from their, their core structure. And what they do is they, they search, the tendrils will contact the environment. When they contact the environment, they wrap around the environment and then stiffen, essentially, um, to, to give themselves a, a strong contact. So essentially, we've been doing similar things using shape memory alloys. So here, um, what you can do is you can um, by heating up uh, shape memory alloys or, or um, uh, nickel titanium wire is, is what we'll see here. You can embed a shape or you can have a memory embedded into the shape of the materials. And then when you apply uh, electrical energy, then you will assume that shape. So this on the, the bottom left, the line on the bottom left is something that you can see um, that basically here. So so here we have, have realized the ability to basically generate a coil with these uh, wires um, based upon the passing of electrical current. What can we do with that? Well, we can do things like this. Um, so here we have mounted a couple of these tendrils um, on the continuum robots that we've seen before, so these searches. And so here what we're going to do in the first video, we'll show um, the, the searcher contacting something solid um, uh, a rigid rod, so it's a wooden rod, and I'll play that. So here we can. So here we can see, hang on, let me stop this for a moment. So, um, stop that. Um, so 
that's interesting. It's a different way to contact the environment. And that's useful for us in the sense that we want to stabilize, for example, the tip camera. And so we want to have it as stable as possible with respect to external uh, uh, forces. But it also gives a view into things we might do to stabilize soft structures in general. So here's an example where uh, on the right, where we have two of the actual um, continuum robots and one searcher tendril. And the searcher tendril is going to grab the second continuum robot and provide us with capability we didn't have before. So first, what we want to do, we want to be able to reach the both the, the green and the red cross. And initially, we can only reach just the one. But when we contact the second of the two continuum robots and then use both continuum robots plus the constraint, we're able to reach both things as the, the video will show. So that gives a that gives a sense of of perhaps working towards the future where where we're looking at um, uh, robot bushes as opposed to perhaps robot uh, tendrils, um, but gives a sense of some of the things, some of the ideas that you can take from plants and the world of plants and apply them in in ways that can be useful to enhance the abilities of robot systems. And I think that's that's a key point for the most of us today at the, the workshop. How can we how how can we enhance one world or the other? Um, by work from the engineering or from the, the biology side. We've, we've also, I'll play one more video or a couple more videos. We've also looked at circummutation. Um, so our perspective on circummutation has been a little different. Uh, again, Emmanuel mentioned it um, with respect to roots and avoiding obstacles. Our perspective has been more from a point of view that we, we're not quite sure, we don't have the tropisms, so we're not quite sure what we're looking for very often. We're just looking to examine. And then at that point, one of the things about continuum robots is that their movements are very non-intuitive to, to people. And so we have an open question of how should we move them in, in optimal ways to try to deal with the environment. And we also, uh, you know, circummutation is something again from Charles Darwin uh, a long time ago, he first talked about it, but we've also been able to achieve on the right in the video here is, is a plant and on the left is, uh, is the robot. So again, we're able to achieve circummutation and we're using that as sort of an optimal search pattern essentially. So in summary, I think I'm moving towards the end of time. So uh, looking at extensible robots. So we're looking at thin things that are like active wires, active cables. And although that seems initially completely disparate from the plant world, what we've discovered by looking at thin stemmed plants and, and, and their operation are ways to make those robots better. And so in that sense, we found it a very rewarding activity. And with that, I'll stop and uh, take any questions if there's some time for that. Thank you very much, Ian, for the fantastic talk. Very interesting. Are there questions? Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Hi, Anna. Thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really interesting. I was wondering uh, uh, regarding the search tendrils, uh, why did you use uh, ship memory alloys? And in general, I wanted to ask you which uh, material related challenges uh, did you find uh, uh, during this uh, building uh, of, the, um, of the tendril robot? Yeah, we, we used um, uh, nickel titanium. Um, so nitinol, basically. And in truth, we used it just because we had experience of using it before. So we knew it was something that we could, um, we could get to, mo to uh, morph into a structure that would be sufficiently solid to hold onto things. And uh, it worked. There are some issues with it in the sense that we, um, things get very hot and you have to use reasonably high voltage to, um, to do the actual uh, to impugn the memory, to impart the memory to the structure. So that was something that we we actually blew out a few <laughs> power supplies, and and so we we had. Uh, uh, it, it's it's one of those things that when you know what you're doing, it's easy. Um, but we didn't know what we were doing exactly in the beginning, and so it, it took a while. So I, I think there's no particular reason why this particular shape memory material should be preferred. Uh, it's just an example. So it's it's very preliminary work on our part in terms of what could be done. And uh, we have uh, lots of ideas and that the area is pretty open to doing lots of expansion on those ideas, I think.
thank you. With uh, Xiaodong Chen, he's a professor at the School of Material Science and Engineering at uh, Nanyang Un Technological University at Singapore, and to you, and he will talk about uh, plant hybrid robots, so an on-demand electrical phytoactuator enabled by conformable electrodes. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Fabien. And uh, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really my great honor, I mean, to be here to present some of our plant-related project. And uh, I, I think I'll change the topic a bit from the general one. It, I think to really show something what we are doing, you know, also some of our perspective, how we really can link between the nature, so-called plant system with the, the artificial system like the device we built. So this is something the one that basically the topic I could not show today. And then in fact, the previous two speakers give very nice talk already to how we can build this kind of plant inspired systems, plant inspired device, I was in the even plant inspired robots. This is something very fantastic research. And in my past, I would go another way how we communicate with plants. How can we talk plants? Because in fact, the nature system, a lot of kind of amazing one. So there's something about how we can build connection with them. So as we know in a clinical scenario, right? I mean, you want to learn how, you know, let's kind of the human, like the heart status, heart health status. Typically we use ECG, kind of electrophysiology equipment to really quantify your so-called kind of heartbeat and also this kind of the signals from there we can know more like plant heart status. So similarly, it's possible we also similar device like here, like this is this is the cartoon so right? We can really communicate, talk with plants, understand plant what's the plant language. Like. But of course, in our basic ways is kind of electrical communication. So this kind of now today use a lot of this kind of digitalized and so on. So the very basic one. In fact, for plants Electric other studies, also not new field. In a sense, you know, early, you know, in mid of last, last centuries, a lot of people try to use this kind of like electrodes, really to understand the plant electrophysiology behavior, because such kind of signals related to environmental stress and also related to different kind of action response, or they were locally or suspended response. So this is something we want a lot of this kind of related work done already. From there, you always see a lot of these kind of signals. Okay, so this is some kind of electrical signals. Typically, for plants, they are kind of three type of signals. If you observe carefully, first one is action potential. So this is something all or not, all or not law. So signals are very is based on constant velocity and also amplitude. It's pretty stable. It's like a kind of neuron kind of signal response. Now, kind of variation potential and another system process. This is two signal, a bit kind of noisy, and then also sometimes not easy to understand, like policy system potential. Even sometimes we also get a lot of signal. We do understand as well. So this is something that I would say for the field, how we build electrical interface with the plants is still kind of early, more deep understanding needs it. And typically for electrodes, there are a few kind of electrodes that we use in, in the systems. For example, we use a lot of this kind, this is a golden method, Invested in silver, silver chloride wire electrodes. This is very, very common use in this kind of like elect plant electrophysiology study. So this has get a lot of this kind of signal and understand biological behaviors. But we go to another angle. We want to build a kind of interaction with the biological systems like plants. We prefer some kind of conform, kind of non-invasive approach, and also try to become kind of conformable. So what that means conformable, because we. We must bear one question. You once have nature system, not as electro system, we always have so-called interface. Interface is resistant or the way called impedance. So take this one as examples for impedance there. Now, this is a plant signal if you get it. This input signal, but in between, you have multiple this kind of impedance there, like the impedance between the plant tissues, impedance of a plant electrode interface, impedance of electrodes. All this is kind of interface electrodes, so in kind of resistance. You want to know your signal as accurate, as sensitive as possible. The one thing you want to do is you must lower down this part of the resistance. 
make this plant cut off as smaller as possible. But of course, in reality, it's very challenging. So that's why we need this kind of conformal electrodes to ensure this part kind of contact process as small as possible. But unfortunately, nature is not like this, right? I mean, to, this is a typical one, but we don't like, first of all, we want conformable. It means when you stretch, bend, different kind of shape, electrode also follows compliant surface. But in nature, we know already, a lot of complicated, like this kind of hairy, rough, even it's kind of fragile, vex, different kinds of surface chemistry. So make this kind of electrodes Modi mod modification development pretty challenges. And then typically people are looking on this kind of hydro gel, hydro gel materials. Because hydro is kind of soft, sticky, not damaged to plants, pretty good signal. Because this is something we often use in the, our human system, like that, this kind of electrodes into it for this kind of clinical application. You use a lot of this kind of gel electrodes. But the kind of question is about gel electrodes that are totally typical electrodes. You have know, solid hydrogel and then also argyl gel solutions. Both could be adhesive, but some problem like for solid gel, less, where it's kind of low, this kind of uh, low adhesion, the single quality is not super because a lot of this kind of air structure. This is something not conformable. In this case, they will dramatically increase this kind of uh, um, noise layer. Another one, this is argyl gel electrodes. Pretty complicated because you need a lot of wiring. So this wiring may hold this kind of connection system. Very unstable. The signal is kind of oscillation. So that's something one we are looking would be ideal solution. So ideal solution will be one of them, one kind of electrodes. Okay. So this is something that can be like a liquid. So once it's liquid, you can, any kind of surface you can add in gel on top. So like here, you can put this kind of liquid like this kind of electrode on top. And then because it's kind of external response. Okay, you remember response, immediately can turn from liquid state to the gel state. So this time the one from liquid state to gel state, make this kind of solid. And then any kind of surface, this kind of a morphology, you don't worry because a beginning is liquid, it can go any kind of, combine any kind of surface features and also very high adhesion, enhanced comfortability. So this is ideal kind of situation. So which resolution? The answer is thermal response hydrogen. For such response has gel, it's typically, it's kind of low temperature, it's kind of liquid status solution. So that's why we put this kind of solution in a refrigerator. And then we we'll take out, put out the surface of animation, immediately because high temperature increase, they will emit kind of gel. So this is something like situation that um, electro we use. So this is kind of EPC polymer system. It's a well-known kind of thermal response this kind of blood, thermal gel. It's not new materials. It's a widely used different kind of application. But we are the first group to bring this kind of concept in plants in the kind of field. So now you can see, okay, so this is liquid, okay? Beginning low, low temperature, liquid state. But once you put it in, in, a, in a room temperature for a while, it makes a gel. So in this case, yeah, especially a lot of this kind of hairy, that this kind of leaf, you don't worry. The typical traditional electrodes don't know no way you can have this kind of conformal contact, but such a way you can do it, okay? It's also very highly adhesion, as, as so you can see. So look more carefully, okay? So this is three electrodes, typical electrodes compared. In terms of the cross section, we do the SCM. This is the first direct evidence to tell you, like these two electrodes, you can still allow this kind of contact layer. You can see this is the leaf structure, broken structure already. And this is our EP, See some of your electrodes. You can see very conformal, whatever any shape, very conform contacts. We, you can quantify the gap weights. You can see this is a something like two to three magnitude lower already in this kind of like gap structure. Then you don't worry. Okay, the signal signal will be much, much higher. Signal noise ratio will be much better. Okay. And another experiment we also do is quantify the adhesion. Okay, so this is make sure the electrodes with the leaf structure, how the adhesive this. In fact, our systems even be, even better in this kind of adhesion. And then in this case, in the impedance measurement, you can see this is our systems. It's pretty much better, but better than kind of like PAM hydrogel, and quite compared with the argo gel, it's kind of liquid status, but we are in solid status. And then in this case, for our studies, Okay, you don't have to kind of fixed position and you don't, don't need it. Okay, so this is electrodes connect on surface. You are put in vertical direction, you don't detach. But in this case, very easy to detach. Okay, so this is something one is 
to us how we can do rapid. So as a result, our signals, signals ratio much, much good, better, and also can do this kind of variation. How strong variation, don't worry. The signals do as good as. Okay, so these are two electrodes we put on the same plant, okay? And then you can see vibration. For red color is our electrodes, we call morphable electrodes. It's white color. For red color, red color is other red electrodes. You can now see the potential, pretty variation. But for our white color one is pretty stable, it is. Okay, so this is something we want to further to evidence to you how important you want to give communication. The electrodes is very important to choose, to select, to get your reliable signal communications. And then further moving on, we also do this kind of, this kind of wound healing. Okay, let's say this is pretty purposely generate heat. Okay, so in this case, immediately it is called action potential generation. Now you can see, for well, both of course response at all. But I think for the right one, in terms of signal noise ratio, much, much better in a way. But of course, we also, in this particular systems, we're also working on other kind of wound healing and results. I think I, I didn't tell you, I, I would just skip. Um, if you want to hear, read more, you can read refer these papers. There are more detailed discussion there already. And now let me switch you to another one. So this is something I think generally it's kind of interesting to the community, especially for the audience here. Soft robotic related. And previous speakers typically you present different kind of plants by this kind of robotics, robotics. And I think this is something very interesting. And I would say we question, I mean, in, in, in this case, you have different kind of material system response system to what people are using. I'll just skip. I think a lot of people know already. But let's go by nature. Okay. In fact, the previous speaker also mentioned already the flight trap. So this is something very typical, these kind of examples. But I'm not sure how many people know for this kind of flight, right now's flight trap, they are very sensitive to mechanical touch. Also, it must have two touch in some time kind of space. If these two touch take a long time to separation, you don't respond at all. So that's something that not many people know. People always say, oh, make no touch. And also if you just one mechanical touch, the flat trap also will not close. Okay, so this is something that one very important, how the two mechanical touch to treat this kind of lobe closure. And from here, we question ourselves, this is mechanical touch. It's possible to have come in electrical touch. It means I use electrical signal to treat this kind of closure of this kind of flight trap. So this is something one with question to us. That answer, yes, we can do it. So this is a typical one example, you know, I just sold to me. So this is, we build a whole system, okay? So this is a virus, this kind of venous flight trap, a flight trap. And this is our electrodes, this kind of wireless communicate with a smartphone. You can wireless communicate with this kind of phone. And this flat trap is also detect, we put this cut it, adhere to the robot hands. And then we can use this kind of electrical to trick, close this kind of flat trap. And this is a kind of for a pencil, you can really you know, hold that. So this is something we, want, we call photo actuators. Now today I want to show you how we make this one work into this kind of photo, uh, photo actuator. In fact, this very simple, it's pretty follows from our previous, previous work. Previous one, we talked about this kind of like conformal electrodes. We built based on this kind of hydrogels. The similar way, we've also built this kind of gel. This is hydrogel interface. But on top, we, because we want to build this kind of long term, so that's why here we change the gold nano mesh electrodes. And then, um, so this is something we want to make sure this kind of like, um, transparent and also can stick there for a long time. And then we can use this kind of like electrical to really trick to really you know, change the kind of action potentials. For action potentials, we really can treat this kind of like, flat trap to close. So basically, it's kind of full like, um, um, electrical response to kind of fatal, fatal actuators. So how this one works? First of all, I've got electrical materials parts. So this is something that electrical build. It's kind of transparent. So this is something kind of no, gold nano mesh. Why is gold nano mesh? Because conductive and also high transparency is very important because with demonstration for this kind of electrodes, we continue for 10 hours, in terms of amount is kind of low, very low content, so no much difference at all. So it means kind of pretty biocompatible, also stable. Another one is also lightweight. If you, this is our electrodes, conformal electrodes. 
much, much light weight, even compared to the flight chart lobe itself. They are much, much low weight. So that's why you don't worry about if this electrode on, on top will change the kind of overall weight of this or overall mass of this kind of systems. And also stretchable conducting for our electrodes. You can see for 30% stretchable, no resistance didn't change at all. So this is something we want to come from fundamentally to share people how we build this kind of material systems to interface this kind of flat traps. Okay, now let's look carefully. So how this kind of flat trap, first one, hydrogel is very important. Without hydrogel, the, the interface is weak, weak adhesion. So that's why the hydrogel can really ensure the conformable interface with this kind of flat traps. And this is a tool control experiment. Okay, so this is something one use this kind of the silver, silver color aqua gel this kind of electrodes. So this is our conformal electrodes. So this is something of course you got this kind of wire connection that makes the system not conformable, contactable, and easily detached. You can see it's immediately detached already, loose connection. But for our case, you don't worry at all. Very conformal adhesive. I would say for us, we are very one of the discovery methods for this kind of electrical response, electrical trick. So typically, very importantly, are two kind of important parts. Not many people really recognize. So for some, you must have two kind of because mechanical two touch. So that's why we also generate two action potentials. Okay, the two action potentials, and also cannot be too short time in the separation. You can see with let's say zero point three seconds. This is the mechanical parts, and then we from here we know already from action potential similar. You cannot be too short, also cannot be too long. So this is something one can see for mechanical one, 68 seconds, no cross at all. 2.0.3 seconds, no cross at all. You must have about three seconds and then close it. So this is something one for mechanical parts, very similar. For us also very similar. So electrical pumps, the stretch hole is voltage much about 1.5 watt to for a flat trap to close. And then, only up to above 1.5, you can see, 1.5 or close, below that one not. And also, the stretch out about 1.5, and, and also must have some so called um, intervals, okay? But mechanical interval is about three seconds, but in this electrical one, it's about 1.2 seconds. Below 1.2 seconds, also no response at all to make this kind close. Okay, so this is one very important. Now, of course, the interval is also voltage dependent. If it is kind of low watt, high voltage, you can choose short time, okay? But low will be a long time. So there's something one. And also not only this kind of a DC column, we also can use this kind of square wave simulation. Also works well, it's about it's similar, about 1.3 seconds, okay? I think basically as just go to this one, always people see me believe it. So in this case, we can, this, this is previous kind of whole plants, but now we can cut, just leave for area, and stick on our particular kind of a holder. And then make whole system by this. Then can, because this is kind of electrical response, so that's why we can really program it. And then wireless communicate with some plants to leave, make this kind of off. So this is how it looks like. This is a really on-demand electrical vital iterators. Okay, so this is the first few movies to just to show people so how we can really control it. This is the kind of robot robot hands made by nature flat trap to pick up the platinum wax. And this is something one can, because we know when time to close, then we can really calculate and then could program when the time to really have a two kind of intervals and, and kind of in response and it can really close this kind of flat traps. Okay, so this is some different speed, can be slow, can be even fast, it's really depend it always can be programmed to capture the moving objects. Yes, I would say we have still many things on going on now. I think you know. I think important for us we are our interest in we build this kind of electrical interface with the plants, and there are many things we can do it. And that's why something we propose one concept we call Internet of Plants, based on this kind of like cyber physical this kind of like interactions, and then in the future. We can do it's all this kind of like precision agriculture, human plant interaction, plant sense, living sensor, even plant networks. Many things we can do if we really understand more in detail. 
And then finally, thanks my students, also thanks for the agency, thanks my collaborators. You are welcome to this Singapore if you any chance. Okay, stay healthy, stay connected. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. I think pretty good Thank time you. control. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And uh, I ask to the audience if there are questions. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting work you have done. I might have a question. I might have missed actually, probably you, you said, but uh, how long uh, uh, did you take it and tested the, the electrodes in time, in the sense uh, how long uh, uh, they can uh, stay uh, connected? Well, I think, yeah, I think for us, it takes one week, weeks, one week, no problem. One, one, one week, week continuously. Continuously, yeah. But I think the one disadvantage I didn't mention for these systems is reversibility problem. Because you can really electrically to close it. Our question is, how do you make it open? Now we don't have a way to really make it open, but let's leave it spontaneous open. So that's a problem for this kind of flat chat. Now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It'll take hours to open it. So that's something one, um, I would say, big problem for these particular systems. Thank you. No problem. So if there's another quick question, we can ask it now. Otherwise, we can also move the discussion to the panel discussion later. And thank you very much again no problem. for your talk. You. And we can. So welcome back after the coffee break for the next session of the um, plant robotics workshop we have uh, three more interesting talks and the uh, next one is from Bill Spitekin which is a professor at chemistry department and national nanotechnology institute at Bilkent University in Turkey and uh, she will talk about self regulation for autonomy in solar tracking plant robots looking forward for this talk and you can share your screen Thank no. you very much, Fabian. Uh, I hope you can hear me and you can see this screen sharing. Okay. So, yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction and also uh, for the invitation, Fabian. It's nice to meet you here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our approach as chemist into uh, plant robotics. And uh, the title of the talk is Self-Regulation for Autonomy in Solar Tracking uh, Plant Robots. So we are going to um, mostly talk about the um, incorporation of chemical concepts in plant robotics, uh, not only the materials, uh, the material side is also very rich and many people are working on uh, developing new materials for soft robots, for plant robots, but on our side, it's mostly the, res the research that we do is mostly about the uh, incorporation of chemical concepts. So for this, uh, we built a very simple system and this is what I'm going to introduce to you uh, today. Uh, as a group, we are actually working on more, more on mechanochemistry and static electricity, which are very much related. So we are mostly dealing with the uh, systems, the chemical systems that start with the mechanical input. So we are uh, sort of tigmotropic. <laughs> uh, if, we, if you uh, go into the details of static electricity, uh, you'll see that uh, it is very much related to the mechanical action on the surfaces of the dielectrics. So it is also sort of related with, uh, as I mentioned, mechanochemistry. Uh, in, um, aside from this, we are also dealing with soft materials and robotics because uh, we think that we have also, um, uh, we, we have also some connections of mechanical action in chemical systems in soft materials. And we can make the chemistry uh, work mm. in uh, soft materials and soft robotics. Okay, so uh, the research that I'm going to show you today is about soft robotics. Uh, but as I mentioned, we 
uh, work mostly on static electricity, how we can remove uh, contact charges, which was also mentioned uh, earlier today. Contact charges uh, uh, remotely by light. And we are also dealing with uh, some interesting chemical systems, uh, such as uh, reaction diffusion systems um, that can take place in uh, hydrogels. So we have also a hydrogel site. And um, yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about the soft robotic part. Uh, and this research was, uh, of course, not done only by me. Uh, it was uh, actually done by a brilliant senior student who was an undergraduate at that time. Uh, and now he is a PhD candidate uh, at Northwestern University in Stup, uh, Professor Stupp's group. And uh, together with uh, another brilliant person who is the uh, who was a postdoc at that time, Fatma uh, Demir. And Fatma is right now uh, pursuing a, a second postdoc in uh, Belgium in VUB. OK, um, yeah, so uh, here are their names once again. And uh, this is what we have done uh, in terms of the plant robotic research. Oops, sorry. So. Uh, when we look at the living systems, uh, you, you can easily see that they respond to the stimuli. And this is what was also uh, uh, very well mentioned, very well expressed in the previous talks. So uh, in plants, this is done by, and in, in other organisms, in other living organisms, this is done by biochemical feedback, by some uh, chemical reactions. And that leads to, uh, um, final result uh, that is seen by, that is observed uh, as the embodied intelligence. So we take uh, the living systems as our uh, bio-inspiration and we try to make some artificial plants as we all do, okay? And in this case, uh, as I mentioned, we said we can probably have a material feedback that can also lead to an embodied intelligence in the artificial plants. And doing this, we try to make uh, the system as simple as possible, as I mentioned. So we started with, uh, first of all, picking the plant movements that we can uh, imitate, we can mimic. And to me, at that time, it seemed easy <laughs> to pick the heliotropism or phototropism or thermotropism, which uh, are sort of related with each other. And on the Gnostic part, uh, the Gnostic um, uh, versions of these uh, tropic motions are photonasty, nictinasty, and thermonasty. So I, we said that in the beginning as a group, uh, we can probably try to mimic these in uh, simple uh, macroscopic systems, not in chemical systems, but in simple macroscopic systems. And in these macroscopic systems, we can then integrate some chemical action. So the first thing is to uh, just um, show the reversibility, the autonomy in the uh, plant motion. So as I mentioned, one of the uh, plant movements that we chose was uh, the heliotropism. And I guess uh, it is not necessary to uh, mention heliotropism, what heliotropism is to this crowd, but still uh, we can have some uh, beginners in the studies. So I will just um, briefly mention what it, what it is. It is simply the uh, tracking of the sun. And if you have phototropism, it will be the tracking of the uh, light source other than sun. Uh, sometimes uh, people also mention growth uh, together with tropic moments. Uh, here we do not have growth. We have just the uh, uh, solar tracking. So this is a, a thing that I want to mention. So no growth is involved in this uh, process that I will show you. Nictinasty, uh, sometimes people People um, do not know this, so it's nice to mention about that one too. So nictinasty is the opening of the leaves during the day uh, to the sun input. And uh, when the sun is away at night, uh, the leaves close. So nastic movements, as again mentioned before, are the movements that do not uh, depend on the direction of the input. So uh, 
previously we just said, okay, we can just incorporate board and see what happens in our system. The first system that we built was actually not a soft robot at all. There wasn't uh, anything soft about it, but we had some nitinol alloys and the behavior was sort of soft. So uh, we decided to uh, send this to the soft robotics journal. And this was the first uh, version that we displayed this, uh, this chemical notion uh, of non-equilibrium systems that can have, uh, that can work between two states. So uh, as I mentioned, this was the first example, although it doesn't have the uh, soft components. So uh, let me just introduce you the, to the system a little bit before I play the movie. So the first one is just the heliotropic one. The one on the left is just the heliotropic one. The solar panels have nothing to do with motion. It is just to assess the efficiency increase when we have the heliotropic moment. You know, when the plants have heliotropism, like sunflower or other plants, they can uh, use the sunlight more efficiently than the ones which are not heliotropic. So this is what we want to, to assess in this system. And that is why we put the solar uh, panels. They were flexible solar panels. And uh, as I mentioned, there is nothing to do with the motion. So in the system, we just had a lens or two lenses actually attached together. And we had four nitinol alloys, um, nickel titanium alloys. And as uh, it's mentioned uh, before, again, uh, these are the shape memory alloys. So uh, they reflect to the thermal uh, input. And this is what we were doing. We were just uh, letting the system under sun so that the sunlight is focused on one of these uh, uh, nitinol alloys, uh, alloy springs, and it is uh, contracting. And the uh, face of the flower is turning towards sun. And then in a second system, we also incorporated uh, nitinasty by a second set of uh, nitinol springs. And uh, let me just show you how it works so you can uh, guess what is going on in here. We are shining the uh, light, IR lamp, from the left upper corner. Here it's not shown, but you can imagine, I hope. So uh, the leaves sort of open with nitinasty. These are the set of muscles for that. And uh, plant turns towards the sun because of the nitinol alloys at the bottom of the body. And when the light is turned off, everything just reverts back uh, because of the uh, uh, springs uh, that work in a reverse, uh, reversible manner. Okay, let me just play it again <laughs> before I go to the next one. So here is the Nick Nasty leaf opening and turning towards the sun <laughs> or the IR lamp. And then once the IR lamp is turned off, the leaves close and they revert back to the, uh, the flower reverts back to the original position. So as you can see, there is, uh, there is autonomy here. <laughs> you can say that, that this plant is autonomous and this is without any um, uh, energy source other than the light itself uh, or the IR radiation itself. So this is sort of interesting. And um, we were thinking about uh, how to improve this into a soft robotic system. And okay, we have we are switching from this hard thing to a more fragile, a softer system by using paper uh, plant robots. So in this case, of course, we have many advantages because we can make our system in five seconds by laser cutting. Uh, even my uh, seven-year-old daughter uh, can cut this out of paper with some scissors. Uh, probably longer than five seconds uh, she will need, but still, I mean, this is a very easy system uh, in comparison to the previous uh, hard one. And then we have uh, four muscles. Previously, we had the nitinol springs, as I mentioned. Now we have very light hydrogels. In the first versions, we just used agarose. So it's a, just a sugar gel. If uh, you don't have much chemistry knowledge, we can just summarize it like that. 
And in the case of the actuation, rather than the phase transition of methanol alloys, now we are just using transpiration. Transpiration is a name that is given uh, for the uh, water movement in plants. So the system is more like a biomimetic system when we uh, come to this new version. Okay, let's see how it moves. Of course, it's cheap. It's pretty cheap. <laughs> Okay, so uh, since we have, I mean, we can make one in five seconds, uh, we can just make many of them and we can also uh, see how the uh, garden of flowers can behave in this case. And as you can see, we can have a different extents of the uh, behavior with respect to the light source or uh, alignment with respect to the light source the ones which are nearer reflect more uh, with the nitinastic leaf opening and uh, bending towards the light source. And the rest is, you know, you, you can see like a gradual response of the individuals in this crowd. I will just play the movie so you can uh, see how they move uh, in a few seconds or in a few minutes. This research was featured in New Scientist and uh, I can, um, actually uh, refer to this article for the people who are new to this sort of uh, um, research topic, uh, because this uh, really, uh, they summarized it really well in this article. Okay, so how does it move? Okay, so how, why, uh, how does it move? Which, with which muscles uh, does the plant move? And how is the reversibility attained? So this is what I'm going to show next. So this is our plant and if we shine light, there are actually two muscles on uh, the left side and two muscles on the right side of the picture uh, that is shown here. So we have like four muscles that are arranged uh, for the nictinacity, we are using the upper muscles, upper pair of muscles. And for the heliotropic motion, we are using the lower pair of muscles. And the trick is that we can actually uh, start with the illumination. And uh, in the hydrogens, we have water and the water starts to um, uh, evaporate from the hydrogen muscles, making them, uh, getting, um, you know, making them shrink. So the, as the hydrogels get smaller, you'll see that for the nictinacity, the leaf opens, and for the tropic motion, the uh, plant bends towards the light source. And as I mentioned, there's a, there is some sort of trick here because when the leaves open and the plant bends towards the light source, we cast a shadow on the muscles, on both of the muscles that were previously working for the motion. And they sort of get cool under this shadow. And once they cool, of course, they do not bend more. And this is how we attain, how we achieve the, uh, the elevation tracking of the phototropism uh, or heliotropism rather than a, a zero one or total bending, non-bending situation. So the uh, shadow is cast until, uh, I mean, when, the, uh, when we have appropriate al alignment with the light source. So if you can uh, imagine an elevation, a lower elevation, the shadow will be uh, casted on the uh, hydrogels in a later state when the uh, flower is bent more. So that was the trick actually. And uh, as you can imagine again, if we have a continuous supply of water to these muscles, when the hydrogels cool down, they will uh, start to suck more water in them and the plant will revert back to the original position. So you can think about the position of the plant as a sort of a, a semi-equilibrium state between these two points, uh, upright and bent states but it always wants to bend towards the light source, to, towards the elevation uh, of the sun, of the light source. So this is how we can have the autonomous motion, uh, autonomous tracking. This, uh, the plants will bend towards the light source opening their leaves. 
So here is the movie that I promised. So the garden of flowers, they do not have the reversible motion because they are not connected to a water reservoir. They are uh, not in soil or any sort of uh, water source. So they do this only once for the video, but you can see uh, different extents of motion uh, from the different extents of leaf opening and bending in the uh, movie. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the plant is moving towards the elevation of the sun with the elevation of the sun or the light source. Oops, sorry. So in this case, uh, this is the perfect heliotropic line, perfect heliotropic response, the ideal response. And our plant is sort of following this line. Uh, and um, these are different uh, soft robots, the different plant robots that are in action. So uh, even with the paper and agarose, you know, you can get pretty good precision with these. So in this case, as I mentioned again, the uh, action is through the dehydration of uh, water from the hydrogels, uh, hydrogel muscles. So we can calculate the amount of water that is in the hydrogels by just putting our uh, plant robot uh, on a balance. And we can uh, see uh, at which angle the water is evaporating more and uh, you know, the angle that corresponds to this water uh, dehydration. And as I mentioned, uh, the autonomy can only be attained if the reaction is reversible. And uh, in order to make this um, system reversible, we have to have a water reservoir or we have to have some sort of wet soil in order to feed the uh, hydrogels that are dehydrating in the first cycle. So this is what we did. And here is, you, you can see the video of the plant, which actually shows the autonomous motion. Now it's autonomous and reversible. As you can see, when the light is on, it turns towards the light source, opening the leaves. And once the light is turned off, it reverts back to the original initial position. So as I mentioned, everything is actually uh, linked to the two opposing forces and the reversibility of the system. For the self-regulation, you have to have these opposing um, motion and these should be controlled by not two inputs, but only one input at a time, which was the light source or light input in our system. And of course, if you have uh, different geometrical designs, you can always uh, play with these designs with these hydrogel actuators. You can have reversibility if you are connecting, connected to a reservoir. In this case, it is uh, secretly connected to a water reservoir uh, at the bottom of the uh, paper that is shown here. Here it's not connected, but I just want you to see how we can get different uh, geometries, the shrinking, uh, getting smaller in 3D. And here is one uh, very uh, exotic <laughs> structure that is working with the same principle. Again, if you're connected to a water reservoir, you can always get the reversibility in the motion. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the chemistry, the chemical concepts of non-equilibrium, equilibrium systems is very uh, helpful in designing that kind of autonomous uh, soft plant-like structures. And we are trying to get into more chemistry uh, as I hear from the uh, um, talks, it was not, uh, I mean, the, the crowd is not uh, really rich in chemists in this case, but I can tell that we can also use the thermoresponsive hydrogens like Professor uh, Chen uh, introduced. Mm -hmm. Many of them are very suitable uh, in terms of getting thermonastic motions as we have shown, but I'm not going to get into the details of this uh, as this is a, a robotics workshop. So you can have 
both chemical concepts and new materials incorporated in uh, plant robotics for that kind of autonomous motion. And I hope that was also uh, interesting, sort of interesting to you as it is interesting to me. And I would like to thank all of the audience who's listening to my uh, presentation right now. Uh, yeah, I'm turning towards your questions. <laughs> uh, thank you, Serena. <laughs> Thank you very much for the a very interesting talk and a very nice presentation. And now we uh, you can ask questions. Maybe I would have immediately a question. Do you think it's possible to make the uh, the hydrogels absorb the humidity also from the air so that the changes in the day and night uh, in the humidity would be enough to activate the structures? Yes, actually, uh, this can work as a humidity sensor in some case, uh, if you would uh, tailor it to work uh, in a more sensitive way. Uh, but with the Agoros one that I shown, uh, it is not really possible to do that. It's not that sensitive, but with more hygroscopic uh, substances, gels, you can always uh, make it work with the day and night conditions. Especially in Ankara, it changes a lot, so you can do that. Hi, Birja. Hello. Hi. Um, Thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really nice. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the hydrogels. So I was wondering if um, the hydrogels that you end up using uh, were uh, a choice of, uh, let's say, convenience um, based on uh, um, the properties that you wanted from these hydrogels, or uh, if you got inspired by some substances uh, uh, that are present in plants. Uh, in some way, if you studied uh, also that part of the natural model. Uh, thanks for this question. It's uh, actually a very interesting question. Uh, at that point, when I started to play with the origami structures, I didn't actually know much about plants and the plant uh, system was uh, just to uh, have some sort of motion that was triggered by light and at that time I knew only sunflower and I started with this uh, model and for that uh, we were really very careless with our <laughs> uh, first choice of agarose so uh, it was the only uh, gel material we had in the lab so we started with agarose and uh, actually uh, having such uh, good results with our initial system, I wrote a project for funding uh, for the thermoresponsive materials. I said that we are going to advance with the thermoresponsive uh, polymers, it is going to rock the ground of the plant robotics, but it was not the case. The best response was still with the agaros, so we continued with agaros. In the thermoresponsive ones, they can work very well if you adjust the surface properties because on paper, the ones that I showed uh, you actually, they are uh, uh, not attaching very well on paper. And we wanted our robots to be made out of paper since it resembles uh, the uh, actual system, the cellulose lignin system uh, very well. And the paper is a, a very convenient material because you don't need to carve in these um, uh, cables, sort of the water uh, carriers, in order to uh, re uh, activate the hydrogels. The paper always stays wet and you don't need another material. So, this is how we made this. <laughs> I don't know, um, maybe I should consider this as the uh, beginner's luck. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, is there another question? I would like to add something. Uh, yeah. After we published this research, actually uh, some better systems with only made up of hydrogels uh, appeared in the literature. This is sort of an old presentation, so uh, and I just wanted to keep it short, so I didn't mention about these. But this concept is growing, and I really like that people are adopting to these uh, these systems, uh, which are reversible. It's, it's always nice to think about this one slide, like where you have the material feedback, how you can attain it with some reversible materials. So there's a lot of chance with the intelligent materials, with the smart materials, um, that can self, that, that can have the self-regulation and uh, that we can use for embodied intelligence that is very well reflected in the living plants. Absolutely, I totally agree also. I, I was thinking already to, to keep this point for the autonomy um, uh, to the to the panel discussion at the end, and I think one part to achieve this autonomy definitely are materials and and um, yeah and chemistry behind these materials and how they interact with the environment because this is uh, yeah this is an important feature which which can be I think realized with uh, with materials so maybe we can we can further discuss this in the um, uh, in the panel discussion after the talks. And I uh, thank you again for your presentation. We can move on. We can move on to the presentation of Falk. If you have attended the Living Machines Conference uh, yesterday and the days before or the, the last year, you will, you will know Falk. He's working in the class of excellence, which is called Living Adaptive and Energy Autonomous Material Systems, LIFMATS at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And please, Falk, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about our um, artificial Venus flytrap demonstrators that for the first time combine the two biological snap trap mechanism into one system. And just to shortly highlight what we are doing, we are from the LIVMATS cluster of excellency focusing on the development of living adaptive and energy autonomous material systems. And let me just put that away here. And we are looking into nature and looking into biological role models and the snapshot motion of the Venus flytrap is actually one of the most complex behaviors on the organismic level without the central control unit, so without the brain. And we use this um, model, um, the snapshot motions, as biological models for novel motion principles of decentralized controlled motion systems for soft robotics like artificial Venus flytraps or these uh, climber systems here using these artificial Venus flytraps as gripper systems. And in our system, we for the first time uh, want to combine two motion principles of um, different snapchat plants. And we have here, the first one is the motion amplification of the water wheel plant Alvanda Vesiculosa, which is based on the release of stored elastic energy inside um, this midrip here and with during the release, um, the trap clo lo lobes actually close and do not change the curvature. This is the case for the snap buckling of the Venus flytrap, where we have here the, also the release of stored elastic energy and the snap buckling of the system when a certain threshold is uh, reached. And the, the system is actually quite interesting, the Venus flytrap, because it is able to discern two distinctive um, triggers here at a normal um, environmental conditions. And the trap actually closes due to the stored elastic energy within 100 milliseconds. We have first a slower um, motion here after the stim um, mechanical stimuli, and then the fast snap buckling motion with the conversion from convex from concave to convex, and then a last phase, so in this three phasic motion, where the um, after the snapbacking, the system closes again. And we want to 
C and combine these two systems in one principle, but there are also already a few um, state-of-the-art artificial Venus flytrap systems in literature, over a dozen different systems that use are driven by different actuation principles. So they use magnetic fields, joule heating, electric fields using DEAs and IMPCs, and humidity, as we already saw today in one of the talks. And based on hydrogels, then we have pneumatic systems, which can do the snap buckling and curvature inversion. And we have photothermally driven systems based on uh, liquid crystalline elastomers and liquid crystalline networks. But actually, none, not all of those artificial Venus flytraps integrate all the Venus uh, flytrap functions. So none of, not all of them have sensors, not all, none of them actually harvest energy from the environment as the um, Venus flytrap does. None of them has actually decision-making capabilities and none of them incorporate more than one motion principle. And we want to, in our system, want to combine two motion principles as I showed you before and integrate sensing, decision-making, energy harvesting in the system using our artificial living material systems that are created in our Lithmus cluster of excellency. And how can the motion patterns be actually combined to create this adaptive and energy autonomous system? We choose to um, start with a low um, with a low cost system here and dem the first demonstrator where we have the a compliant foil based system that uh, imitates the snap trap lobes with a foil with a um, polymeric foil and the midrib here is a rigid backbone and microscopy slide and if you activate these uh, ears here of the system then we have through the kinematic coupling like the other one of the that the system closes and when you um, push the central so bend the central midrib here then the system snaps open like the venus flytrap which you can see here in this small video. So we have the closing here, like the kinematic coupling of Aldrovanda and the snap opening of um, um, Venus flytrap. And we actually characterize and use different um, actuation principles. So we use pneumatic uh, systems actually to characterize this um, mo new motion principle. We you then use um, contactless driven magnetic actuation to see if we can augment this um, motion principle further and see if we can achieve resonance like motion. We also do uh, want to integrate environmentally driven systems and actuations. So we used for thermal actuation, actually also shape memory alloy springs as we saw in the talk before. And we use for a second system and a stimulus combination for a system initialization and locking and unlocking of the system where we uh, combine shape memory polymer backbones with a hydrogen system. And how does the pneumatic system actually work? We use a backbone with three pneumatic chambers. So the outer ones, if they inflate, the system will close, the, close and uh, the central one then bends the midrib here and opens the system with that. We can actually generate this complex motion now and analyze this which you can see here in our high-speed video recordings, you see that the outer cushions inflate, close the system, and then it snaps open again through the bending on the mid of the midrib. This is um, dependent on the activation time. So we have here these, um, these the uh, cushions are inflated at 400 milliseconds, and uh, we achieve a closure between 100 and 300 milliseconds, depending on the activation time and a snap opening depending between 20 to 70 milliseconds. This is actually not depending on the actuation uh, duration because this is depending on the release of stored elastic energy. And what you can see here, we have three different demonstrators here. And you can see here the different uh, actuation times. And you see that the opening here is really always around under 40 milliseconds and only in these two cases here, we saw a higher uh, opening, a longer opening time. So the opening time is defined first motion to fully open uh, both lobes, which you can see here when you look at the left one, you can see the parallel movement that is uh, both are opening at the same time. And here you can see on the right side an unparalleled movement. And actually all the opening times of, of 40, over 40 milliseconds occurred due, due to this delayed opening. 
And we can actually discern now through the characterization, the motion cycle into five phases. We have this first disclosing phase here, then we have an opening phase with an initial downward movement and an unrolling movement, a curvature inversion to the side. Then we have the oscillating around the open state and a reactivation when this when the uh, pneumatic cushions here are the pressure is released and we have an oscillating around the initial state this can also be seen in our speed diagram and here you can clearly see that the opening phase is actually fastest motion in during this five phases so we have achieved here around 4.5 meters per second and with that we created a new movement sequence that is even faster than both biological role models and we wanted to see now if we could augment this further and see to uh, achieve a repetitive motion and achieve a resonance like motion we use for that um, a magnetic activation where the magnets are attached to one ear and we have a, a rotating magnetic field and this is actually highly dependent on the energy um, that we put into the system and what you can also see is that the left uh, low pier is a bit faster and has a bigger movement uh, curve here but you can also uh, kind of kinking and there if the system snaps back up the, the speeds are actually higher for the left lobe than for the right lobe and you can see here that we achieved around at 400 rpm we just see a slight wiggling at 800 and 900 rpm we actually go into this natural frequency type and it's really highly dependent on the energy that we add because at around 1000 rpm we get these erratic motions and breakout motions what we did not achieve was actually a complete closure of the system here, but it this was not the case that we, that was not the aim of this um, actuation principle here. We wanted to see if we can achieve fast and repetitive motion systems that we could then use for UAVs, but these are still under um, research and we will present these um, findings in the future studies. And to achieve now in environmentally driven systems to achieve an autonomy, we used a temperature driven system here. This is actually now sped up eight times. So we have here, we just raise the um, temperature around the system and the system closes then in correspondence. And we also wanted to see if we could now use two different um, stimuli, environmental stimuli. So we use moisture and temperature change and this is induced motion in a, our hydrogel coated check memory polymer backbone at around 20 de uh, 60 degrees and 20% relative humidity is still bent. But at 75% rel relative humidity, you see that these are, the system is straight again, this backbone. And this is actually due to the rehydration and heating up about the threshold temperature of the um, backbone and how this is actually built. So we use a 3D printed uh, low TG backbone. So this has a low glass transition temperature and uh, over 50 degrees Celsius to get flexible. And the hydrogel is um, coated in this groove. And if we would here now is a detached backbone, um, dry the system on a heat plate. So this the backbone is heated up about the glass transition temperature and the um, the hydrogel is dried, then the system actually bends towards the system. And we use this um, combination to lock and then unlock the system. We tested that in a um, climate chamber and there you could see that we have a really a transition zone here between 50 and 70 um, percent of relative humidity. There we can see the change in our after 75, you see that the system is completely straightened out. And we use actually hot steam to rehydrate and cause a snapping, which you can now see here in this small movie here, the system is not actu actuatable. And when we now insert this in, into this hot steam, the system is actually uh, released and can be actuated again. With this system, we actually now use two environmental stimuli to actually control the uh, locking and unlocking in the system and actually can also see a, um, can generate a motion to this, uh, to hold this in this unlocking state. And we wanted to also to see how much energy these motions actually take. And we did a um, characterization with our universal testing machine and built uh, different uh, testing setups for this. And 
always applied the force in the direction of actuation, actually. And what we could also see here and investigate was this uh, unparalleled opening here, because this was quite interesting. What we saw is that we have a release of the stored elastic energy here in the system. Here, the first um, flap opens, then the second flap opens, but this is actually uh, takes roughly around eight new over a bit of eight or nine newtons and takes a bit more energy than actually a parallel opening this, which takes a bit more force, whereas the energy is uh, lower. And this is also the force drop here also indicates the release of stored elastic energy and the closing actually requires less energy than the opening. And in comparison to our biological role model, the Venus flytrap here, which takes a approximately 300 micromole of ATP, which corresponds to 9.66 joule of energy. Our pneumatic system actually only needs around roughly 50 millijoule of energy to open and close the system. Our magnetic actuation um, around 18 millijoule and the thermal actuation of using the shape memory uh, springs here, depending on the electricity that we use and uh, takes around 120 millijoule. So with this system, we actually created a system and with these actuations, it is faster than the biological role model and even takes less energy to um, actuate the system. And with that, I would just like to shortly summarize my talk. I showed you that we developed a novel motion principle through the combination of two motion principles of Snapchat and one low-cost soft robotic demonstrator here, and that the parallel movement is actually crucial to outperform a biological models in movement speed and energy requirements. And in the future um, systems, the sensing and energy harvesting will be integrated into the system, and the motion patterns will and are currently used as energy harvesting to move energy harvesting structures for autonomous uh, soft robot system novel gripper technologies. And with that. I thank you for your attention and all our collaborators and Fabian for the in invitation to this um, yeah, workshop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fag. Very nice, very interesting talk. Um, are there some questions? Do you have, I have a question regarding the four different types of actuation. So do you think this is one which is, let's say, the most promising to work on future uh, prototypes? Yeah, I think the, the most promising one is the combination of the hydrogel with the shape um, memory polymers, because there we get actually can generate systems that can react and move through the, um, yeah, to environmentally stimulate changes. And there, I think that the, in that lies the future. So we have, you know, can create autonomous systems that actually can adapt to the environment. But to achieve the most controllable uh, motion, you can also use the pneumatics because this is a quite easy to use system. Nice. I also like the I love this energy com, um, comparison, and was uh, so the do, do you know it's a technical uh, question? Do you know how the the um, energy consumption of the plant is determined? I saw that it was an, a literature citation. Do you mm -hmm. uh, do you know how the how that is done? So they use uh, uh, measured actually the ATP that they used, and so and computed that from that. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to to actually also um, do this energy requirement because we want just want to know how much energy they use, and to be able to drive the systems actually in the later version and also the sensing um, via solar cells, for example, when we integrate a energy harvesting from the environment through flexible solar cells into our system, then we need actually to know how much force or energy is needed to actually only close the system. Yep. Absolutely, yes. No, that's a very interesting and important parameter.
Are there further questions from the audience? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> then thank you, Falk, again. You're welcome. That, uh, I also liked a lot your workshop yesterday on, on thank you. Uh, soft and robotics. Thanks for the invitation to give this talk here. <laughs>